I am from Chicago, Illinois, South Side, and uh, born in the Bronx uh, of 13 siblings, and uh, came to Chicago after the death of my parents in, in New York. And my family was divided uh, between the uh, siblings, and so the younger ones came to Chicago, the others remained in New York. Uh, and so uh, that, that's what brought us to Chicago. And uh, in terms of the community, uh, my family is very, very uh, multicolored. That is, my mother was Puerto Rican, and my father was African American, but nobody could tell because he had blonde hair and blue eyes. And so my family and I uh, always struggled between the two cities of New York, in which my uh, older siblings spoke Spanish, and the younger ones who grew up in Chicago only spoke English. Um, religion was the was was totally a, a function of my family's life. My uh, grandmother raised me, uh, and she was a Baptist woman. My aunt also raised me, and she was Pentecostal. So I grew up between two two uh, traditions: one well, Baptist in the, in the Sunday morning between uh, nine and and twelve, and uh, Assemblies of God between one and six. And so religion was a simply part of our life. I grew up uh, very conscious about uh, religious experience, about life, and about faith. I was a, a sick child, and one of my earliest religious moments in my formation was when my aunt took me uh, to a faith healing service. In that faith healing service, I was just a little one, but I heard some of the most fantastic music that one could ever hear. I heard a sound of, uh, I knew now that it was an organ. But to me, it just sounded like a heavenly uh, an instrument. And then this woman in white appeared. And I thought it was an angel. And she came to the stage, and my aunt lifted me up, and she touched me on my forehead. And she said, this child would be fine. And then my aunt took me back. I knew, learned years later that the woman who touched me was Catherine Coleman. Catherine Coleman is uh, the mentor of Benny Hinn. Uh, so he talked about the Oral Roberts community of uh, Pentecostal, Neo-Pentecostal healing. And so uh, faith healing, these sort of things, that the experience of religion became paramount to me from that earliest experience of uh, be, being uh, touched and healed uh, by uh, Catherine Kuhlman and the faith healing ministry. My, mother was, my grandmother was a well-educated uh, African-American woman. And even when we were, her children were in school, uh, she went back to school and she ran her own business out of our home. She was a caterer, ran her own business, and entrepreneurship was part of it, but she insisted on education, and education does not take, does not overcome the necessity of faith, because you had to have faith to get through the education, because so many weren't, so many didn't, and so many in my family didn't make it. And so education and faith were always tied together in my household. I stayed at home until I was 25 years old, uh, taking care of my grandparents because I thought that's what God had called me to do. I needed to take care of them. Then my mother was very sick at the time. And then I, she came to my room one day. She got better. She came to my room one day. She sat on my bed. She said, baby, you're going to have to go. And if you don't go now, I'm afraid you're never going to leave. From that moment on, I decided that I was ready to go to college. So I went to Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, a little one, not too far away from her. I could always get to her, but it was the first stab of my uh, independence and education and moving outside of Chicago to, uh, for college. So Trinity Christian uh, College in Palos Heights, Illinois is where I did my undergraduate degree in history and theology. Again, uh, from my experience, uh, not many people know about what it's like to be the only one. So if you're talking about Trinity Christian College, I was the only one. Black. You're talking about Calvin Theological Seminary, I was the only one black. That presented its own tensions for me about uh, education, but also faith and the seriousness of faith. That I had to, as the only one, have a double portion, as, as people would say, a double portion of, of that, the old folks would say, that unction. That unction that gets you over when you know that the wall is against, when your back is against the wall, when they don't expect you to exceed where they don't expect a black young man from Chicago to be able to read historical texts, to be able to read German thinkers, to be able to read and understand John Calvin or even Schleiermacher. So it was always this uphill uh, journey to uh, identify or to 
transcend the limitations of, of the white gaze, the white perspective, the white limit on what an African American thinker could be. And so being the only one in those institutions, I had that extra burden. I remember one particular instance where when I went to Calvin Theological Seminary, the main discussion among my classmates and my dorm mates was who's going to sleep in the room with the Negro. So I pastored uh, several churches in the Christian Reform uh, denomination, Grace Christian Reform Church in Grand Rapids. Uh, but once again, there was this, there was just, there was this yearning. That there, there had to be more. The, the ministry was not it for me. Uh, I, I was good at it. I was very good at it. But there was a, a vacancy. That vacancy was intellectual. That vacancy was there's more to learn. There's more to know. There's more outside of simply the practice of ministry. So after three or four years of being in ministry, uh, I decided that it was time to test it. And so I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. Uh, I had a professor named Nicholas Waltersdorf who was teaching at Calvin College. Uh, and uh, I was telling him about my experience. He says, uh, why are you only applying to theological schools? But I said to him, well, he said, you're applying to any Ivy League schools? I said, no. He says, well, why haven't you applied to any Ivy League schools? I said, because I probably won't get in them. <laughs> and, that white man, <laughs> that white man took out a piece of paper and he just started writing a handwritten letter. And he wrote this letter, he said, I want you to take this letter in your hand and I want you to go to Princeton University and I want you to hand this letter to Dr. Jeffrey Stout and then come back and talk to me. I go over to Princeton and I hand the letter over to Professor Stout and he didn't say a word to me. I sat there for 15 minutes, he still didn't say a word to me. He was reading the letter and after 20 minutes of reading the letter, he said, so, uh, uh, what makes you want to come to Princeton? And I said, well, Professor Walter Strong <laughs> thought this would be a really good place for me to study. That was the end of the conversation. That was the end of the interview. But before I got back home, uh, I took the train out there. Before I got back home, uh, I had a phone call. When I got to my back to Calvin, I got a phone call, and it was Jeffrey Stout. He said, "I just wanted to tell you, I talked to a few people. You're in." And so, once again, I still you look back on those periods. I still see how uh, this relationship between faith, faith guiding, even when you just feel like uh, there's a, the mountains are insurmountable. And for me, that first experience of uh, actually being admitted into graduate school was daunting because it created another faith crisis. Now that I've been admitted, can I do it?